a small village on the Somme helps us trace a journey to the old front line. Names scratched on ancient walls somehow flag the past, and a tree-lined avenue makes us reflect on those long columns of soldiers who marched ever onwards in 1916. We never seem to be too far from the Somme on this podcast, and this week we're back on the Somme battlefields, but not in the front line areas, not in the places where those battles took place in 1916, but behind the lines in the village of Engel Belmere. And this is a village which I suspect very few of you will probably have visited on your journeys along the old front line. It's just off of the battlefield area. From one side of it you can see the Thiepval Ridge with the Thiepval Memorial sitting atop it and then on the other side of the village you can see towards the trees of the Newfoundland Park. So it's very close to two of the most popular, the most visited areas of the Somme today, but a village that gets few visitors. So why are we here and where are we? Well we're actually on the western side of Engel Belmere. We're just off of a street called the Chemin de Forceville and we're outside the communal cemetery. We'll come back to that shortly. But the village of Engel Belmere sat just behind the British front line on this northern sector of the Somme battlefields. When we took over this sector in 1915 from the French, we inherited villages like this, which they had used to billet their troops and which we used to billet our own. To the east of Engel Belmere was the front line close to the German-held village of Beaumont Hamel. And to the north, another village behind the British sector, Mai Mai or Mali Mallet as the troops call it, and then to the south, the Ancre Valley. Villages like this form part of the British infrastructure on the Somme. We tend to think of the Great War just in terms of trenches, but soldiers who fought in that war only spent a minority of their time in those frontline positions. They would do stints of seven to ten days, then go away to a village close to the line like this, be billeted here for a few days, then go back up, take over the trenches again, and rotate their way through the front line and the behind the lines areas like this on a regular basis. And often they would then have extended periods of rest when they would come to villages like this to do training, to do exercise, and to rest, in inverted commas, in terms of how the army viewed that. Often rest was just an excuse for the army to employ men on labouring duties, carrying equipment and war material up to the front line, or bringing back sandbags of spoil of chalk that had been dug out of the mining galleries that were inactive on this part of the Somme. In addition to the men coming and going from the front line, there were also those rear echelon units, the units that operated behind the lines, behind the front line battlefield area. And these were all part of that infrastructure very often. So the supply troops, the Army Service Corps, motor transport units of the Army Service Corps with lorries, motorised lorries, would bring their supplies, no matter what they were, up to points like this to then be distributed towards the battlefield. There were also medics in places like this treating the wounded. And then as the war went on, you saw all types of labour troops coming through here to work on the physical infrastructure behind the battlefield. So the approach roads, the light railway systems and the tramways and all the other types of ways in which the army moved men, equipment and ammunition and everything else backwards and forwards across the area where the fighting took place. And as the war moved on and the war became a, a proper total war, it wasn't just men from Britain who were serving here, but it was the wider empire as well. So men from many different nations, many different backgrounds and creeds came through here. South African Native Labour Corps, British West Indies Regiment, they all served in villages like this behind the front lines in that winter of 1916-17 as the Battle of the Somme came to an end. The investment in labour troops from many different nations, eventually even going beyond the empire to China to recruit over 100,000 Chinamen to serve in the Chinese Labour Corps, meant that travelling around the area behind the lines on the Western Front in those last two years of the war, as an ordinary Tommy from a working class city or town, you would see men from so many nations in a way that you would never have seen them in civilian life. So it exposed men to different types of people from different types of background and different nations 
and different cultures in a way that in their ordinary life they never would have experienced this. But that's the social history side of it. From the military history perspective, the investment in all these people, in all these approaches to supply and moving men forwards and taking them off the battlefield and replacing them and bringing up shells for the guns, food for the men to eat, petrol for the vehicles, fodder for the horses and the mules and the donkeys. All of this investment, and I use that word a lot in this podcast, was one of the ways in which the road to victory was paved because it meant that we had a modern army that could keep itself in the field and relied on the wider pool of men and resources that when you compare it to the German army on the other side of no man's land, they simply did not have that. But from the ordinary soldier's point of view, villages like the one that we're going to walk through this week were a really important part of their war experience. They often identified with villages like this more than they did with the shattered landscapes that they saw on the actual battlefield. Often when I used to interview the veterans back in the 1980s, they would talk fondly of a particular village in which they'd spent a lot of time. Almost all of them had one or two villages where, by circumstance of fate, they'd found themselves for long periods. So they'd grown attached to them almost because those villages, not necessarily in the direct eye contact of the enemy, certainly within range of its guns, but different to the experience in the trenches, these were places of safety for them like a haven almost out of the reality of the battlefield. And of course in many of these villages there were French civilians, so they saw ordinary people, not combatants like them, men and women in uniform, they saw men and women who were civilians, just like their own family and their friends back home. I'm sure there's probably a PhD in how British soldiers reacted to these places when they were out of the line, but we shan't go into that here in any greater depth. But if we went back 105 years, and this year is the 105th anniversary of the Battle of the Somme, in October 1916, as the Battle of the Somme was moving towards its conclusion, Engel Belmere would still be an area of great activity. The Battle of the Ankh, which took place on the 13th of November 1916, was looming close 105 years ago, and this area to the northern end of the battlefield where that attack would take place saw a build-up of men and equipment and guns in preparation for it. By that time in the Battle of the Somme, possibly even before the battle began, it's likely that there were very few villagers left in Engel Belmere. When we first took over in the summer of 1915, probably quite a high percentage of the population was still here, possibly even running cafes within villages like this, because the Somme had been a pretty quiet sector up to that point. But as the reality of the battlefield got closer and closer in particular with the use of poison gas which would drift off the battlefields the British army struggled to supply its own men with enough gas masks let alone have to supply them to French civilians so the safest course of action was to move those civilians away from the battle area into places of safety so villages like Engel and Belmere became military encampments where all you saw was khaki and the evidence of the war. When the Battle of the Somme finally did come to an end, villages that had been just behind the front line were now further back, so much larger camps were constructed in places like this. On the far side of Engel Belmere, down towards the Ancre Valley, there's some evidence of some Nissen Hut style camps there, and I would guess during that cold winter of 1916-17, units that were out of the line from holding that uh, part of the Somme front were then brought back to places like this for proper rest. The Royal Naval Division is one example of that who spent a lot of time in this part of the battlefield during that cold winter. When the Germans withdrew to the Hindenburg Line in the spring of 1917 and the fighting moved to the ground around Arras and Combray, this became even further from the front line. It was still an area of military activity. I don't think any of the villagers came back in any significant numbers. But the war did return in March of 1918. The Germans broke through on the Somme front and the Germans reached Albert by the 27th of March, less than a week into their attack. And the ground around villages like Engel Bilmere became very close to the front line indeed, even closer than they had been at the beginning of the Battle of the Somme in 1916. 
This remained then a quiet sector until the summer when the final push moved the fighting away from here for good. And then I suspect the villagers did return, did come back to reclaim what was left of their houses and their land and try to turn their hand to peace rather than war. So we begin on the western side of Engel Belmere. We're standing outside the entrance to the communal cemetery just off the Chemin de Forceville. And once more, as they're proving very popular with you all, there'll be a map of this on the podcast website, oldfrontline.co.uk, so you can follow the route we're taking on Google Maps. And what we're going to do is start here at the cemetery, then walk through the village. We'll see what remains of the Great War in a place like this, and then we'll move up to the long tree-lined road that runs from Engel Belmere across to the neighbouring village of Auchanville, and we'll talk about approaches to the front line, and then we'll end not on the front line itself, but a little way behind at the site of some British bunkers from the Great War. But first, the cemetery. As we open the gate and come into this communal cemetery, there are in fact two cemeteries here, a communal cemetery and a communal cemetery extension. The original graves, the original communal cemetery burials, are just on our right as we come in. This part of the cemetery was started in June of 1916 and remained in use until September of that year. So there were a few pre-Somme battle burials and then some from the beginning of the operations through to about halfway through. It was used again in April and May of 1918 when, as we mentioned earlier, the front lines were not that far away and it's the smaller of the two burial grounds in that there are 51 British burials, one New Zealander, six French, and one whose identity is not known. Most of the graves, when we look at the cat badges of the men buried here, are from units in the 29th Division. This was a unit that had served at Gallipoli the previous year. It was made up originally of battalions of British regiments that were in the far-flung corners of the British Empire when the war broke out, and they were recalled to Britain, thinking no doubt they were on their way to France, but instead they were brought together into this new formation and then sent off to Gallipoli. And they'd fought right through that Gallipoli campaign from the original landings on the 25th of April. And we spoke in last week's podcast about the Gallipoli cemeteries when we went to V Beach. And that V Beach landing was part of the 29th Division operations in that opening stage of the Gallipoli campaign. And they stayed there right throughout, and most of the originals, one way or another, were killed, wounded, or went sick. After Gallipoli, they went to Egypt, and from Egypt they went to Marseille, and they made their way by train up to northern France. And they took over the sector in front of Beaumont Hamel and the area around Red Anne Ridge in the late spring of 1916, in most cases March or April of that year. And they would remain in those positions opposite Beaumont Hamel, staying in villages like this, Engel Belmere, in the approach to the Battle of the Somme and the early phase of the Battle of the Somme, and suffer tremendous casualties on the 1st of July, over 5,500 casualties in their attempt to capture that village of Beaumont Hamel on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. One battalion that particularly stands out when you look at the cap badges is the 2nd Battalion South Wales Borderers. You can see the Sphinx of Egypt and the word Egypt underneath on the South Wales borders cap badges that you can see in these plots. And that's a nod back to part of their previous history when they fought in the Egyptian campaign of 1882-84. to This is a period when they emerged as county regiments and they incorporated some of these battle honours into their subsequent cap badges. The later Battle of the Somme casualties that you see here also include a few men from the 2nd Battalion, the York and Lancaster Regiment, that served in this sector in the late summer of 1916. And of those 1918 graves that are here, there's quite a few men from the Royal Naval Division. Now, they too had served at Gallipoli in 1915, but jumping on three years to that final year of the war, this was now a battle-hardened division that had fought on the Somme at Arras in the Third Battle of Ypres. And here in the spring of 1918, it was brought down and defended this area north of Albert and then stayed in this sector until the early summer of that year, holding positions in ground very close to the village of Engel Belmere. From these original burials, we continue along the path through the French Civil Cemetery with graves right up to the present day. But if you look carefully amongst them, some of the older graves do contain memorials to men who died in the Great War. In in some cases, 
they contain the remains of soldiers who died in the Great War because French families could repatriate their fallen sons and brothers and husbands back to their own cemetery to be buried in that family plot, and that's not an uncommon thing. But as we get to the far end of the civil graves, we can see to our left another gateway into the next part of the cemetery, which is the Engelbelmere Communal Cemetery Extension. Now this is a, a proper military cemetery within this civil plot with a, a gate and a cross of sacrifice and a wall and it's a larger burial ground. When the original plot was closed in September and why that one was closed and the graves then made here is not recorded. Possibly there was better space here for the subsequent burials or maybe that position where the graves were right by the road was under shell fire at that particular point and it was felt too risky to bury the dead there. But for whatever reason the graves began here in October of 1916 as the Somme moved into the autumn and the winter approached. It was then used until March of 1917, so until that point where the Germans had withdrawn to the Hindenburg line and then, like the original plot, graves were also added here again in 1918. Although it's larger than the other plot, it's still a fairly small cemetery, but 49 of its graves come from another place. They were moved in from Bosart Communal Cemetery Extension in the 1920s, and also some from the nearby battlefields, isolated graves around this village of Engel Belmere. Bosart was a village similar to Engel Belmere, behind the lines, medical facilities there, billeting area for the troops, and a cemetery was made there, but rather than keep that permanent, for whatever reason, it was closed and the graves were moved here instead. There are now 120 British burials in the cemetery, including one unidentified, 27 New Zealand, and one who is completely unknown. There are also two special memorials to men who were buried in Bosart Communal Cemetery Extension, and the exact location of their grave is now not known. At one stage there were five German burials here, but these were moved in 1923. The reason for that is often a complex one and not entirely clear. In some cemeteries the German burials are retained, in others they're moved. In this case they probably went to Freecourt or Vermandevilliers is another possibility. It's not recorded in the original cemetery register. A lot of Germans were buried in British cemeteries because wounded Germans were brought in off the battlefield, treated in medical facilities, died of their wounds and then were buried by us. Or men went out on trench raids to try and capture a German prisoner, often hit that German prisoner a bit too hard and sometimes they died of those wounds. And when Germans raided our positions, often they left some of their dead behind as well. So in all these kind of cases, and there are probably many other scenarios as well, German dead could end up within our hands and were buried by us. We didn't just toss them in shell holes, we respected them as soldiers and we buried them in places like this, just as the Germans did exactly the same on their side of the battlefield. So when the British raided the German trenches and left behind their dead, they were buried by the Germans. Further down the valley, in this case, towards the village of Miramont, for example, there was a, a cemetery at Miramont where captured British soldiers who died in German hands were buried, and there are still some graves there today. In a future podcast, perhaps we'll go and make it a visit. But coming back to the communal cemetery extension where we are now, there are 27 New Zealand graves here, as we said. Why are they here? Well, the New Zealand division in the spring of 1918 was brought down from Flanders, and it became one of the key formations in this part of the battlefield to help stop the German advance at that period. Albert had fallen to the south, but in this northern area, the Kiwis and New Zealand division held the Germans, particularly on the high ground around the village of Auchanville, just down the road. So the New Zealand graves that are here date from that March and April of 1918 period, when they stopped and held the Germans in this area. And they cover quite a few different New Zealand units, and it includes men who had once served at Gallipoli, the first theatre of war that these men fought in. So again, there is that Gallipoli connection here with the 29th Division Graves, the Royal Naval Division, and also these men from the New Zealand Division. Another thing that you notice in cemeteries like this that are behind the lines are quite a large number of cap badges of men in artillery units. So in here there's a lot of men from the Royal Field Artillery and the Royal Garrison Artillery. The Field Artillery had the field guns, so 18-pounders up to 4.5-inch howitzers, the Royal Garrison Artillery operated siege guns from 6-inch calibre and above. 
So those types of artillery units were very active in villages like this where there were dead bits of ground, dips in the ground where you could hide gun positions so they could fire up onto the German trenches and beyond that in the area in this sector around Beaumont Hamel for example to protect your troops when they were in the front line if the Germans attacked and also to assist them in their attack on the German positions when the Battle of the Somme began. So aside from as we mentioned all these different rear echelon units transport units bringing out supplies the artillery would have been very very active here she'd have seen the horses of the gunners bringing the field guns and the medium guns up and then maybe even halt tractors these caterpillar tractors dragging the heavier bits of artillery to be set up in their gun positions to fire onto the german trenches beyond and although the gunners were often called thousand mile snipers by the infantry who thought they had a cushy war both sides were always looking for each other's gun positions to try and destroy them using aerial observation, aerial photography, balloons and so on, even sound ranging to try and work out where the gunfire was coming from. And they sought to destroy them. So gun sites were often under enemy artillery fire and gunners were killed. And to spot for the guns, you needed to have eyes on the ground. And that meant a team of gunners with a forward observation officer going forward, signalers to report back to the gun site using lamps, using flags, using whatever method was, was necessary to communicate that information. They were right on the battlefield itself, exposed and vulnerable, and casualties amongst them was pretty high. So it's not surprising to come across the graves of gunners like this in cemeteries close to where they had their gun positions. For me, my first journey here was in the 1980s, not to see the Gunners, not to see the Kiwis and the others, but because there was a Sussex connection here. The village of Engel Bilmir was one of the first places that the men of the South Downs Battalion of the Royal Sussex Regiment came to when they moved down to the Somme from northern France in the summer of 1916. They began to arrive here in August of that year. And there are South Downs Battalion burials from that August through to that early September period. This was their first period of service, in the Somme trenches. They were not taking part in any great battle at this particular point. It was very close to their attack at Hamel on the 3rd of September, but before that they occupied some of the positions around the village of Hamel and also in what the trenches that are now part of the Newfoundland Park at Beaumont Hamel. They were in that part of the line and they buried some of their early dead in this cemetery, including Private Miller, SD614. So that number, his regimental number, 614, indicates that He's one of the very early enlistments in the South Downs who joined in September 1914 when 1,100 men were recruited in just a couple of days. He would have then come out to France with the battalion in March of 1916, probably been in reserve at Richbourg because only one company from his battalion had actually taken part in that attack because his colonel, Colonel Grisewood, had refused to take his men in, claiming that he wasn't prepared to sacrifice his battalion as cannon fodder. We've spoken about this in some previous podcasts. But Private Miller was killed in a quiet sector, in a quiet period of the battalion service here on the Somme on the 30th of August 1916. He came from the Sussex village of Pevensey, just down the road from Eastbourne and Pevensey, with its castle, was made famous because on its beach is where William the Conqueror landed with his troops to change England forever. That area of East Sussex brought in a lot of men like Private Miller to serve in the South Downs battalions. And when I stand here in this quiet corner, this quiet country corner of the Somme, and stand by his grave, there is a kind of link back to Sussex. It's chalk downland area, the birds are in the trees... There's such a symmetry to me between Sussex and the Somme, and I guess there always will be. But aside from the Sussex lads here, one that I remember seeing when I was walking the routes for my Walking the Somme book in the, uh, in the 90s was the grave of a regimental sergeant major. Now, an RSM, there's only one of those in an infantry battalion, so to lose your RSM is quite a significant moment in the history of an infantry battalion. And buried here is RSM George Benjamin Wall of the 2nd Battalion King's Own Yorkshire Line Infantry who died of wounds on the 10th of February 1917. He was originally born in Chelsea, possibly because his father was a regular soldier and he may well have been in Chelsea Barracks. He enlisted at Pontefract and prior to that he'd been living in Stockton-on-Tees. 
He joined up in 1893 and he served in Gibraltar, South Africa during the Boer War and also Hong Kong. And as a regular soldier, he was sent overseas almost immediately the war broke out, landing in France on the 14th of August 1914. The loss of this regimental sergeant major would have been a great blow to this battalion, but not as great a blow as it was to his family. He'd left behind a wife and four children. So RSM Wall had been mentioned dispatches in October 1914, and in one account of his service it said he died nobly doing his duty. And that word duty really sums up what a regimental sergeant major was all about. So from here we'll bid farewell to these lads, close the gate behind us, walk down the path and out through the main entrance of the civil cemetery, follow that minor road onto the Chemin Forceville and onto the main road that runs through the middle of Engel Belmere and we'll continue until we reach the church and that will be our next stop. As we walk through the main street of the village of Engel Belmere it's not untypical of the Somme villages that we see when we come to these battlefields. The population is always fairly small. I'm not entirely sure what it is in this village, but I would guess somewhere around the 200 mark. There's a mixture of some modern builds and much older houses. And this is the thing about these villages that are behind the lines. They weren't in the area of total devastation. So that means they retain quite a lot of their original pre-First World War buildings. And it gives us a bit of an insight into what soldiers saw when they came here, but also into what the villages on the actual battlefield itself that were destroyed might once have looked like, because there was a common building style. Wattle and Daub style farm buildings, red brick buildings, and a mixture of red brick and white chalk stone. Pierre is the French word for that type of stone. And you see that in quite a few different buildings within Engel Bilme, including the church that we're standing in front of now. And I'll put a picture of the church on the podcast website. But although it was so close to the battlefields, the front line only being just a couple of miles away in front of Beaumont Hamel, and in 1918 much, much closer, the village was shelled. It was damaged, but it wasn't razed to the ground. So there are buildings where, quite literally, we can reach out and touch the past and touch structures and buildings and walls that British soldiers brushed along going to and from the trenches. So they're quite powerful places to visit in that respect. And while you don't want to pry into someone's privacy, into their private garden or house, it is quite useful to stop in villages like this to look at particularly some of the farm buildings to get an idea of the sort of billets that soldiers slept in during the Great War. And what we find are like big hangers, really, often with a, a brick base and then a Wattle and Daub style wall that is the main structure of the building and a massive wooden A-frames on which the pitched roof sits. And if you look inside, and you can do that by walking through Engel Billmere without, as I say, invading someone's privacy, you can see the sort of spaces that the soldiers lived in. And in your mind's eye, perhaps picture soldiers there in hammocks or on straw resting before they move up to the line or resting having just come out of the line. And when you look into those buildings that you know were there during the war, you wonder what kind of conversations once echoed around the walls. What were these men talking about when they were going to and from the trenches? What did they say to each other? We, we can see this from contemporary accounts and diaries and letters, but it does set your mind racing. And I think it's fascinating really to be able to peek into what was once their world in that way. As I mentioned that South Downs battalions were here in that summer of 1916 and the 11th battalion which Private Miller served in included a young officer, Edmund Blunden. He went on to become a major 20th century writer and poet and his book Undertones of War, which is the description of his experiences as a young infantry officer in the Great War, is a classic account of that conflict and I'll put a link to that on the podcast website. Blunden's father was the schoolmaster of the village of Framfield in East Sussex and he'd grown up really in the countryside and was a country boy. So you get a sense in Blunden's writing of his connection to the countryside of the natural world and him talking about what it was like to walk round places like this and spot the birds and see what was happening in the fields. And he's left behind in Undertones of War this little description of some of his early time here at Engel Belmere and I'll read that for you now. For the moment, our much-impaired battalion was billeted in Engel Belmere, 
a sweet village scarcely yet spoiled. James Cassells, who had spent the day in the shell holes between the German trenches and myself, were ordered to look after one of the two makeshift companies who paraded for roll call outside the clay barns and were then given a few hours to themselves. Cassells had spoken a couple of days ago of the prospect of sitting in the barrage with the wind whistling through his hair, but now he said nothing of that full experience. He was wondering how he was still alive. Our billet was a chemist's house, well furnished, with ledgers and letters strewn about from bureau, chiefly the scrawl of poor people in Thiepval and other places of the past who bemoaned the bad crops and their consequent inability to pay up. Again, autumn had come. Crops were still bad. We were an affectionate pair and poetically minded. With a little rum and much rhyme, taking a quiet side bedroom as our own, we gave each other a sturdy good night. Hoarse and ponderous roars of high explosive in the orchard outside interrupted that night, which we unwillingly finished in the cellar. Engel Belmere, indeed, was now entering upon a dark period. Its green turf under trees, loaded with apples, was daily gouged out by heavy shells. Its comfortable houses were struck and shattered, and the paths and entrances gagged with rubble, plaster and woodwork. Still we explored the church, into which opened a mysterious tunnel. As if on holiday, we examined the brightly painted saints and the other sacred objects from gallery to vault, and hard by found a large collection of the Engel Belmere Parish magazine, which was and was not interesting. Reorganised, the battalion was quickly sent back to the more obvious kind of war. The village of Engel Belmere was only a moment in Blunden's time in the war, but he kept some of that paperwork that he mentioned, and I believe it's still stored in the Edmund Blunden archive, wherever that may be. Continuing past the church, we walk to a junction on the east side of the village. The road goes round to the left, heading up towards the next village of May May. On this junction, this was a, a route going to and from different destinations, and there were a lot of gun sites down the road to our right. The ground dips away and there's some dead bits of ground there, very suitable for gun positions. So this would have been an area of quite some activity. And back in the 90s, when I was walking the Somme in preparation for the book that I wrote, Walking the Somme, which I'll put a link to on the podcast website, I came to visit villages like this and obviously speaking French often bumped into farmers and people who would ask what I was doing or I would ask them about certain things. And it always seemed to open doors, quite literally. And on this junction, it's gone now, there's a modern house there, but there was the ruins of a building there where there was quite a big cellar and in the cellar the walls were covered in the names of British soldiers. It was a period that sadly I didn't have a camera with me so I wasn't able to record any of this. If only I'd have had iPhones in those days. But how I came to see this was thanks to a farmer who had a farm almost opposite and he took me into his farmyard and showed me another cellar there where there was some names scratched on the wall. But I noticed that he had some drain covers in his yard that were covering up the big sump in the middle of his of his yard where he had his tractors and they weren't just any old drain covers they were sniper's shields from the trenches of the great war so you saw a lot of this sort of great war recycling taking place in farms like this even 80 odd years after the conflict and it continues even to this day as many of you found as you travel around the battlefields but these two places that i saw on this junction were nothing in comparison to the next building that he showed me, which is further up, and we'll follow that road round towards May May, go past a hangar on the right-hand side, and set back is a ruinous building that dates back to the 1740s. You could once see it more clearly because the date was indicated with wrought ironwork showing when it had been constructed, and it is one of those typical Picardy buildings with this mixture of red stone and white chalk. And this had once been a a thatched building, a farmhouse with its own piggeries. And he took me in there and showed me it had actually been converted entirely to piggeries. It had been pretty much destroyed by the Great War and then left to be neglected. And he'd subdivided the internal rooms with concreted walls and once kept his pigs in there. But it wasn't really suitable for that anymore. And again, he pointed out on the walls quite a substantial amount of graffiti that had been carved there by British troops in 1916 and 1917. There were quite a lot of names of men from the 62nd West Riding Division, 
the West Riding, the Yorkshire Territorials had served on this part of the front in that cold winter of the War of 1916-17. And as I walked up the, the main corridor of this building, which was almost the entire length of it, I noticed that sticking out of the wall were a number of 0.303 inch bullets. They're not the bullet heads, the actual complete round. And I remembered some of the veterans that I'd interviewed that said they often used to carry with them a 303 bullet where they'd remove the cordite so if the primer was accidentally struck it wouldn't actually ignite the bullet and accidentally kill or injure somebody. What they would use it for is to push into a wall or a piece of wood or whatever and create like a peg that they could hang their equipment on. And so I looked at this and thought, you know, I wonder who'd left those pegs behind during the Great War. Who was the last man to hang his webbing gear or his leather kit up on that wall during 1916 or 17? So it was really quite an, an evocative place to come to. Now, now it is private property. You can't just wander in there and, and have a look around this place. And it's also in quite a ruinous state, so potentially dangerous. If it is something that you want to go and have a look at, then I'd advise contacting the Marie in, uh, in Engel Belmere, and I'm sure they'll put you in touch with whoever owns it. I'm going back to a time almost 30 years ago now, so I don't even know if that farmer is still alive. But it just shows what remains, archaeology really, of the Great War there is scattered in these villages behind the lines. In fact, I have never been to a village that was behind the front on the Somme where I haven't found British graffiti. British soldiers with their jackknives or whatever else they had seemed to be scratching their names on walls pretty much everywhere that they went. And I'm thankful, as I'm sure we all are, that they did because it's left behind this little trail of men's names scattered across these places where men sheltered and rested and waited to move up to that ever-turning wheel of the front line again. It makes you wonder, did these men sense they were part of history, sense they were part of something bigger than them? And as mankind has done over centuries, over millennia, they left behind some little mark that they had been there. So I think that these are not just names on a the wall. They're somehow much, much bigger than that. And it would have been great during the centenary to see some kind of project that then searched for these, photographed them and recorded them. Maybe that's a project that comes with the next generation who visit the battlefields of the Great War. I hope so. So this street that we're in, Rue Monsieur it's called, that uh, takes us past this building on the right up to the northern, the northeastern side of the village of Engel Belmere and out onto a new road, the road that takes us to Ocean Villas and that'll be the next part of our route. This road we're on runs roughly northeast from Engel Belmere towards the neighbouring village of Auchanville, or Ocean Villas, as the British Tommy called it. I don't know if he had a, another name for Engel Belmere, I suspect not. There's probably not something that you can really easily substitute with that. But as we walk away from the village and Engel Belmere is behind us, there's a section of this road in the first part that's tree-lined. A lot of the roads on the Somme when I first came here in the 1980s were very much like this. I find them very evocative of the Somme landscape these tree-lined little minor roads that weave their way across this chalk landscape. And there are fewer and fewer of them. Tree-related diseases in the 80s killed quite a lot off. The main Albert Bapaume Road had trees on it that were cut down during that period. And even these smaller ones have gradually disappeared. So this one is a, is a bit of a treasure, and I'll put a photograph of it on the podcast website for you. There's a really great interview with Lynn MacDonald where back when she released her song book in, I think, 1983, she was asked what, for her, is the best mind picture that she has of the Somme, having interviewed all those veterans. And she spoke about that whenever she thinks of the Somme battlefields today and she connects it to the generation of veterans that she interviewed, it's exactly what we see before us now, a tree-lined avenue with a long line of British Tommies marching to or from the line under the strict eyes of army discipline, but yet allowed to sing, and that whole column is swelling to the sound of a popular tune. And when you stand here and when you walk along roads like this, that's what you think of, that's what your mind perhaps flashes to, that 
shaky archive film, that black and white film that we have from the period that shows footage after footage of battalions marching along very similar roads. So I think that coming to a battlefield is not just about going to the preserved trenches and the museums and the visitor centres and, and even the war cemeteries. It's a lot more than that. And I think that if you really connect to these places, which I know many of you who listen to this podcast do, coming to a, a place that most people would just drive past and walking along a tree-lined avenue with a village that was a billet in 1916 behind you and there in the distance in the faint glimmer on that ridge was where the front line was. You are literally, quite literally, walking in the footsteps of that generation of the Great War, and I think that in itself is a very powerful thing to do. And we'll continue along this road. It's not tree-lined all the way, sadly, but it brings us out into those big, open, vast, some landscapes, the sort of landscapes that I love to photograph when I go there. And as I'm recording this, I'm just a couple of days away from returning to the battlefields of the Western Front, and I really can't wait to do that. But as we virtually walk along this together, there's a couple of rows that go off to the right, and we're going to take the second one, and that takes us down to a couple of British bunkers that are just by the side of the road. British bunkers are not really that common. The British philosophy throughout the war was to attack, and bunkers are defensive technology. And it's only in areas where you see a long period of static warfare that you tend to see bunkers being constructed by British units. But there are, as always, exceptions to this. And these two, when you read Peter Oldham's Armageddon's Walls, which is his book that uh, followed on from his pillboxes of the Western Front, Peter Oldham has chronicled these pillboxes at different points along the Western Front battlefields. He says that these were built in 1918, and indeed on the Somme battlefields at that time, quite a few observation-style bunkers were constructed. These two, one of them is definitely an observation post, the other one may have had a bracket for a machine gun in it. But what's interesting is that going back many years when I was researching this part of the Somme, I looked at a lot of the intelligence papers and war diaries and headquarters diaries for the units that took part in the attack in this area on the 1st of July. And although these bunkers themselves may be from 1918, Peter Oldham doesn't give the source by which he's worked out when they were built. What I found in those papers is that there were definitely bunkers or observation posts on this spot on the first day of the Battle of the Somme because there were men manning them who observed what was happening in what is now the Newfoundland Park to the south and then across towards Hawthorne Ridge where the mine had gone off just over to our left. And if we stand with these bunkers behind us, so they're behind us to our left and our right now, we are getting the view that the men inside them would have had across this landscape. So to our left, extreme left, is the village of Auchanville. To the right of that village, we're looking out across the open landscape of the Hawthorne Ridge and we'll see the trees of the Hawthorne mine crater and then to our right the more organized trees the darker trees of what is now the Newfoundland Park and across to our sharp right in the distance we can see the Thiepval Memorial on the skyline there so observation posts are always built in locations where there's good visibility and a good vista for them to take in and you can see standing here why these were built here so whether the actual concrete structure is from 1916 or two years later in some respects doesn't really matter because this you could see this is why they put such an observation post here and what must the men inside these have seen on that first day of the Battle of the Somme you remember it was a, a day that had perfect visibility a perfect sunlit day a sunlit picture of hell as Siegfried Sassoon called it and from here, even with the gun smoke on the battlefield and the smoke generated by the explosion of that mine going off on the Hawthorne Ridge, they still would have seen the lines of infantry move forward and then gradually fall as the machine guns scythe them down as they did so often in these attacks on this part of the Somme on that day. When you come here now and you look at the bunkers, they're on farmland. The farmer doesn't use them. You can get up to them and even really go inside them, although there's not very much to see there. A few years ago, I came here with a friend of mine and we found some Webley cartridges at the back of it. So at some point, someone was discharging a pistol here for whatever reason. The front lines were very close to this area in March 1918, so maybe it was then. 
when you stand here and look at them, they don't necessarily immediately strike you as being bunkers. They're almost like ancient monoliths, some kind of monument to an ancient society or an event that happened so long ago. And the Great War is more than a century ago now. Its last living witnesses of the events that took place in locations like this have been dead for more than a decade. A handful of daughters and sons whose fathers were killed in the war remain, but generally our connection like that to the Great War has been lost. The world has moved on, and perhaps these bunkers are monoliths now. Markers, beacons, to that dark world that was once the old front line. You've been listening to an episode of The Old Front Line with me, military historian Paul Reed. You can follow me on Twitter at Somcor. You can follow the podcast at Old Frontline Pod. Check out the website at oldfrontline.co.uk where you'll find lots of podcast extras and photographs and links to books that are mentioned in the podcast. And if you feel like supporting us, you can go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash oldfrontline, or support us on Buy Me A Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash oldfrontline. Links to all of these are on our website. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>